Now, <clears throat> I, I'm afraid I've already spoken too much today, and I'm starting to lose my voice, but um, I'll move up to the mic a bit, or move the mic. Yeah, I'll move up to the mic a bit. Can you hear me okay? Um, um, I, I, I come here um, possibly as the representative of, of a fictional think tank, like the one uh, mentioned at the end of the film, um, of which I am the last surviving member of staff. Uh, we're very short-staffed <laughs> at the Institute, and, um, uh, and I'm not um, really up to the task. But um, I was asked to come and talk about privatization. Um, so I prepared this sheaf of notes to inflict on you. Um, and at, one, at some point, you're going to say, we've had enough, shut up. We want to start the discussion. So um, bear that in mind, please. And don't hesitate to do that. Um, uh, I put this picture up because um, it's a letterbox, a postbox, as you see, um, and because that seemed to be um, relevant to the evening's business, uh, but also because it's made in Falkirk, um, like a lot of post boxes, possibly all post boxes, I don't know. Um, I think, it, I'm not sure it was made by, but it, 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 it says on it that it was from Falkirk. Um, and um, I worry about that. I worry that it doesn't feel at home outside the Bodleian Library, but it seems to be all right, so uh, it gets painted quite regularly. Um, anyway, um, the other thing I want, I want to say a few things as a preamble. The first thing is that that film um, is a product of the state, um, and um, I um, am... Well, I'm also, well, I'm not a product of the state. I was, you know, I had parents, but um, <laughs> um, uh, I, ben I have benefited throughout my, I was born in 1950, I've benefited all my life from uh, a more or less benevolent state. Um, and I've worked almost exclusively, don't, I only noticed this a few years ago, I've worked almost exclusively for public sector bodies. <coughs> Uh, possibly because of my market vulnerability. People do say that about so-called independent filmmakers. They say they suffer from market vulnerability. Um, um, and um, in fact, we're misnamed. We're not really independent at all. Uh, we're quite often rather dependent. Um, I generalize, I shouldn't generalize really. Um, so um, I also noticed that I live in a city um, which has the lowest proportion of private sector employees of any, in its workforce of any, any in the country, according to some people, um, which struck me as a bit funny. Um, and that, that um, if these films have a, um, have a uh, precedent uh, in the UK, uh, and by, by, well, by the way, I should also apologise for talking a lot about England, um, uh, despite the provenance of the post box. Um, the films about England, most of the films I made, in fact all the films that I made, ever made that are about things are pretty much about England, because it seems to me that's where the problem is. Uh, well, that's where the problem that I'm attempting to look at let's say, is, um, uh, so the, 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 um, the model for this, well, it's not a model, but the, 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 uh, I was prompted to make these films probably by the work of the GPO film unit uh, and its successes. Um, the mainstream, I mean, the mainstream if you follow the mainstream from the GPA film, film unit, it probably goes into television, probably goes into the BBC. But So I'm a kind of belated, um, perverse echo of those films. Um, a kind of volunteer, a volunteer bureaucrat, if you like. Um, in fact, the first film I ever made was, was presented by a fictional body called the Department of Inversion, 
which was a, um, a voluntary bureaucracy um, modelled on the Department of the Environment. Um, so, anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, now, the post office, um, as you may know, was formerly the general post office, established in 1660 by Charles II, um, and was, is unusual among privatisations because it's always been a public... Well, until it's, it, it, it had never been private before. A lot of privatised entities uh, that we're familiar with um, had previously been private, with the exception, I guess, being British Telecom, which used to be part of the post office. <coughs> um, uh, the, um, at some point, I can't remember when, the, the GPO changed its name to the post office, and at, at another point, more recently, the post office was split into two, the post office, as it is, uh, and the Royal Mail, which, although the Royal Mail had existed for many centuries, it had never been an independent entity called the Royal Mail until it was fattened up for privatisation, which is quite funny if you think about it. Um, you could be privatising the monarchy almost. No, I mean, not, you're not, but you, it sort of looks a bit like that. You know, they've still got their head on the stamps and everything. Um, so, what is privatisation? Now, um, I think the first time I encountered it was presumably in the 1980s. Uh, and um, it was a public share sale, so British Telecom having been spun, British Telecommunications had been split off from the post office in 1980, uh, having previously been called post office telephones. I don't know, if, I think it's, is it Chigley or Trumpton? Does anybody know? Uh, the children's television series, there's a song that starts, ring, 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 Trumpton. something. Is it Trumpton? Yeah. Post, uh, and the, uh, uh, post office telephones about someone working on the line. Um, and when I was a kid, you know, that's what it used to say on the manhole covers. It said post office, P-O-T, post office telephone. Um, but it, uh, they, in 1980, it became British Telecommunication, and then it became, it was privatised in 1984 as British Telecom. The first, I remember seeing this, because the, the, the van, post office telephone vans used to be sort of dark olive green. Uh, British Telecom vans were yellow. Um, and I think for a, maybe they were called post office, maybe it was POT for a bit, but anyway, the first time I saw a post office telecom con van, I was possibly riding a bicycle down Sussex Gardens in London, and this van came across the road, and someone had, they'd put the new livery on, and, and some bright spark had stuck the M on upside down, so it didn't actually say British Telecom, it said British Telecal. Um, uh, they, but this was before they were privatised, uh, it must have been about 1981. Were, actually, the share sale took place in 1984, I learned yesterday. I, I, well, I was reminded yesterday in my researches. Uh, and it was closely followed by the British gas share sale in 1986, which had TV ads and all sorts of things. But most privatisations, however, are not so widely put about, uh, especially nowadays. Especially, I mean, nowadays they seem to happen on the quiet. There was one only recently, last month, the Green Investment Bank was sold off to Macquarie, an Australian entity company, uh, without anybody much knowing about it. I mean, I read about it somewhere, but it wasn't, you know, well, there was no big deal about it. Uh, and it's a seemingly some sort of disaster. I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't really know what the Green Investment Bank did, uh, but it's gone to Australia. Or oh, it's fallen into Australian hands, put it that way. Um, so often, this is what happens. You know, what's wrong with the UK? Well, it's a nice place, but it's, it, fall, it has a habit of falling into the wrong hands. Uh, there are many other models of privatisation, management buyouts, acquisitions by private companies, the sale of Rover to British Aerospace in 1988 comes to mind, gradual sale of shares, BP, for instance, uh, which wasn't fully nationalised. It was only, a, um, according to Wikipedia, it was a 50.0025% holding that Churchill bought in 1913 of then Anglo-Persian oil. Um, and I don't think they ever had any more than that. Uh, but it was sold, the shares were sold fairly quietly between 1979 and 1987. <coughs> 
in, I think, three lots, I'm not sure. Uh, and there's a whole story about BP and Iran and all the rest of it, which I could tell you, but I don't think we have time for that tonight. Now, the other thing, of course, that happens is outsourcing. Um, and um, I, I think, again, going back to this business of being a public sector artist, I'm not really a public sector artist. I'm an outsourced contractor, so to speak. I'm like Serco. Um, and there are lots of us. There are lots of similar outsourced uh, para-state entities in the, in the art world who work for public sector bodies but aren't actually part of the public sector. I was, for that film, I was, I was staffed, so I, I, was, um, I was salaried uh, to make the film, but that's unusual. Um, so, um, now, outsour the, so outsourcing involves um, companies like Serco, and you can probably think of lots of others, uh, and has been, taught, has been dubbed the parastate economy by um, a, 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 a research outfit called Cresc, um, the centre for, I've forgotten what it stands for, but it's um, Carol Williams and other people in Manchester and at the OU. Uh, and they wrote something, they published something in 2009 talking about the undisclosed redistributive settlement which had characterised the development of the UK economy since... I guess, since the Thatcher period, during and since. Uh, and they pointed out that of, um, that is, of the, t that compared with, there are five points, they, they, they were, point, they, they were, this was published in 2009. In 2007, there were five point million people, or 22% of the total workforce in the state sector, but plus 1.7 million private employees in para-state sector, in the para-state para sector, dependent on public support. And that state and para-state accounted for 57% of all new jobs created in the last 15 years. That's the last 15 years before 2009. I quote, Our argument is that the UK has had an undisclosed... Sorry. Has an undisclosed business model of using publicly supported employment to cover the continuing failure of the private sector to generate and distribute welfare through job creation. Which is quite interesting when you think about it. Um, and in their paper, there's this thing about the, 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 the deal was that the, the city got to let, let rip, uh, the city of London let rip, and, um, but there were a lot of public sector supported jobs created in the regions. And that's basically what's happened. Uh, to large parts of the country in the last, I guess, 30-odd years, nearly, nearly 40 years now. Um, so, why do they do it? Um, uh, and again, going back to the 80s, I, I think I thought when I first encountered this phenomenon um, that it was the government trying to raise money. Uh, that privatisation, the motive behind privatisation was to sell things off for as much, much cash as possible to fund tax cuts or whatever, um, or indeed unemployment. Um, but in fact, the sellouts are often botched and they're often too cheap. Uh, we saw that with the post office. Sorry, with the Royal Mail, not the post of the Royal Mail. The post, the post office, of course, hasn't been privatised yet. But I did see not that long ago an article somewhere that said post office about to break even. Uh, and you kind of think, oh, that's why they're selling off all these posts, closing down all these post offices. Since I was asked to come here, my local sub post office has suddenly disappeared, along with uh, having uh, the second of two in a year uh, in, the, in the locality. Um, and so um, one wonders whether um, there isn't another privatization coming along in a minute of the rest of the post office, apart from the Royal Mail. So, they, I mean, obviously it raises money, but it doesn't seem to raise very much money. So, uh, the second possibility, well, the second explanation is, there, is a belief, a pernicious belief, that, possibly pernicious belief, that the private sector creates wealth, in quotes, creates wealth, but the state only spends money. Uh, and the, and the, the sort of related belief that the private sector is more efficient. Now, I don't believe that. I don't know whether you do. But, I, mean, it's, you know, I have no evidence to think that the private sector is in, in any way efficient when you sort of see what goes on in companies like Vodafone and all the rest of it. Um, you know, first-class travel, goodness knows what. <laughs> 
Um, it's just a different kind of inefficiency. Um, and I have no evidence that the, that the public sector, and I haven't, I haven't any more any evidence, I mean I used to work, on the rare occasion that I've actually worked in the public sector, you do sometimes think maybe that this could be done more effectively. Uh, I did work briefly for the GLC and I'm, people now say very nice things about the GLC, but when I worked there, well there were questions, you know. But um, uh, so, but I think I, it's unfair, you know, to, 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 to assume, as the, as the English often do, I fear, that the public sector is inherently um, uh, a kind of um, conspiracy of producers against consumers, if you like, which is the way it tends to be presented. Um, but the, I, I suspect that the real reason is something that I don't entirely understand, but that the, it, it's a search for profits after growth stalled in the 1970s, uh, since when capital has looked for new areas of exploitation. Uh, and hence, we, see, we have seen a shift from production to seeking rents from assets. Um, I don't know, I mean, if anyone's an economist, uh, who can correct my language, then please do. That's tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes, well, yes, I don't want to steal their thunder. But they, <laughs> there you go. Now, going back to the film, um, um, what I, I also realised when I'd been asked to talk about this, that although I didn't think the film was about privatisation, um, it is quite well stocked with examples of privatisation. So I went through it... Uh, and selected some. Um, well, this is one. Because although at the time of the film, the Royal Mail had not been privatised, but it, there was, it, was, it was discussed. The film was photographed, as you might have noticed, in 2008. So, uh, uh, and it was completed. Um, well, yes, just as a matter of information, it was, the script was recorded in March 2010, before the election. But the film, of course, wasn't completed until a few months after the election. So there's a sort of rather feeble attempt at a joke about the surprising outcome of the, of the election. Uh, and in the film, I think it sort of sounds as if some coalition of Labour and the Green Party had won, uh, um, which sadly didn't, didn't happen, um, uh, because I don't imagine that the incoming coalition would actually have, have set up um, the, well, he didn't. He didn't set up these regional centres to um, to uh, rebuild our shattered nation um, from the ground up in quarries. Um, but anyway, um, what's that's that? Now, this is a representation of the the root of the film without the map. I took the map out because I know some people don't like maps. Um, and <laughs> but the wavy line. Um, uh, I'll just wave stand in front of it. Um, it starts sort of here, and there's a tentative journey out there, and then another one out there, and then it starts properly in about May, and proceeds anti-clockwise, or widdershins, as some people say. Um, and the first, this is Oxford kind of theatre, which is where I live, um, for some reason. And um, uh, because the film was about dwelling, it seemed to me that you didn't have to go very far because you could do that anywhere. Uh, whereas the previous, the previous film had, had gone kind of all over England, you know, you know, which you know, kind of death-defying uh, bout of motoring. I didn't really want to do any motoring. I didn't want to stay in any hotel, so I stayed pretty much. You know, I didn't go. That's a kind of forty miles away. Uh, but the, the first, the first definition, the first defined destination was Newbury, which I'll come to in a minute, um, and. Um, the film pretty much made itself up as it went along, so it wasn't planned. Uh, this being um, unusual for me, it's usually you have to say what you're going to do, even if you don't have to write a script. In my, in my, you know, um, previous um, projects, uh, but with this one, I was kind of in charge, so I didn't have to ask anyone. I just did. When I just went down the road, basically. Uh, anyway, this, um, this is another example. Uh, this is, a, uh, as you might remember, this is a gas pipeline marker. 
and I'll just give you an update on it. it it's still uh, this, the, it's still a marker for the pipeline of southern gas nut networks, except they've now been rebranded re as SGN, uh, which also stands for Scotia Gas Mark Network. So because it's, um, it's not just southern, it's other bits. Uh, and they have four shareholders. SSE have a 33.3% stake. Borealis Infrastructure Europe uh, are still in there with 25%, um, which is, I think, the Ont it's Ontario, it's a Canadian local authority pension fund, anyway. I can't remember, it's O-M-E-R-S, I can't remember what that stands for. And the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan Board still have 25%, uh, but the remaining 17.7% .7 of SGN is owned by Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. So that's what, um, so this is kind of the nation's plumbing um, uh, it used to be part of the national gas grid. Uh, the national grid used to be the electricity grid, but then at some point after the privatisation of British gas, it became uh, gas and electricity. Um, now the national grid has also been privatised, and it still runs half of the eight regional gas grids. But four of them have been sold off. I don't know why, but that they are. There you are. Um, now, the next place, this is Harwell in the foreground. Um, Didcot Power Station on the right. And this white streak at the back there uh, is the mini factory. BMW's kind of refurbished fragment of what used to be Morris Motors. Um, I think underneath... Underneath the new cladding, there's probably bits of the old factory, but it, it's pretty smart these days, <coughs> and, and extremely successful, um, uh, and is um, one of the few large private sector employers in Oxford. Um, now, the Harwell Science and Innovation Campus, as it's now called, is the descendant of the Atomic Energy Research Establishment, which it was built on the site of RAF Harwell, a World War II airfield, RAF base, um, and subsequently became part of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. It's now, I think, owned by the Nuclear Decommissioning Agency, which is a state entity. Uh, and it's, it's planned that it will be decommissioned by 2025. So the, the atomic energy bits are being gradually grubbed up uh, and replaced by the Harwell International Business Centre, which seems to include something called AEA Technology, which is a privatised bit of the Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, that happened in 1996. Now owned by something called Ricardo AEA, um, uh, now that, so that's and that's kind of growing. There's also the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which includes the Diamond Light Source or Synchrotron, as it's known, and the European State Agency. So this is a mixed economy here. Uh, the campus is still owned by the UK. Ah, oh, yes, sorry, the campus is owned. This is elsewhere. Some somebody says the campus is owned by the UK AEA. Uh, and the Science and Technology Facilities Council and the Health Protection Agency. It is managed, however, by the Goodman Group, an Australian property company. So they get, you know, they're in there. Um, now, um, so that's halfway to Newbury. Now, the reason why I wanted to go to Newbury is to find Spenum land, specifically to find the Pelican Inn. And again, that's in the film, so I won't trouble you too much with it. Um, but um, I wanted to reiterate something that is in Polanyi, something that is a theme of Polanyi's book, um, The Great Transformation, which is referenced in the film. And Polanyi writes, Our thesis is that the idea of a self-adjusting market implied a stark utopia. Such an institution could not exist for any length of time without annihilating the human and natural substance of society. 
it would have physically destroyed man and transformed his surroundings into a wilderness. And then he goes on, which isn't in the film, inevitably society took measures to protect itself. And this is, um, this is Polanyi's so-called double movement. Uh, and um, it was, people, some people wondered, in the, in the, I remember reading in the autumn of 2008 an essay by Robert Wade, an article in New Left Review, I think, where he, he raised the possibility that the crash of, 90, of 2008 was, the, was, the, was kind of peak neoliberalism and that we would then see a swing back uh, uh, to the other part of the double movement where society takes measures to protect itself. Uh, and then he said that maybe... Um, I'm not sure how he put it, but um, uh, this was, it was not an uncommon thought, this, at the time, that, that, that something would change as a result of the crash, the disgrace, you know, the, 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 the neoliberals had, had, had really messed up and were in disgrace. And society, society would take measures um, to somehow redress the balance. Um, and for, but, but very quickly, it, it, it became clear that the effort was to resume business as usual. Um, and that went on for some time, except that now, perhaps we see how that happened. Um, and it, I mean, it's kind of a case of be careful what you wish for, because whether the current predicament is any better than the, well, I mean, I don't think it is any better than the predicament of 2007. Um, but it seems to me that one can, one can identify um, what, for some reason, is now called populism um, as something not a million miles away from society taking measures to protect itself. Or it's just that it, it's not quite come about in the way that one might have hoped. Um, I'll leave that with you to think about. Um, and, and any, I mean, actually, any fool could have guessed that if you look at the 1930s, really. Uh, it's not, it doesn't take very long to figure it out. But anyway, sorry. Um, uh, and this, anyway, this, this is the Pelican Inn. This is what, well, it's not the Pelican Inn. It's an empty office building. But it, it once was the Pelican Inn. The Pelican, or the Georgian Pelican, as it seems to have been more properly known, uh, was a coaching inn on the road from London to Bath, what's now the A4, except the A4 has moved out of the, it goes around the town now. Um, and um, this is where the Berkshire magistrates met to, uh, in, um, to, uh, uh, whatever they did, the Speedham, to, to introduce, um, to invent, um, to, uh, Initiate, that's right, initiate the so-called Spinamland system, uh, which um, uh, was a, a system of outdoor relief uh, to support um, people at a time of dearth, and coincided with the, as the film says. Sorry if you've heard, it, if, you, if this is repetitious, uh, um, coincided with. The other side of the double movement, because this is why this is this is why Polanyi is so um, uh, um, concerned with Spinham land, coincided with the um, the changes to the Settlement Act, which allowed uh, the rural the the the, 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 the the rural workers workforce to migrate to cities without being in fear of of being removed when they got there. Uh, the act, I think, was called an act to prevent the removal of necessitous persons until they shall actually become chargeable. Uh, and um, what that means is if you, if you went from Newbury to, say, I don't know, Reading or somewhere, to get a job in a biscuit factory, um, or even to London, which is perhaps more likely, um, or a village near Newbury, uh, then you couldn't be sent back if you were thought to be a pauper, until you actually were a pauper, 
until you actually made claims on the on the poor law, on the, on, the, on relief, you 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 could go there. Um, whereas uh, in earlier times, there were these tales of people being um, sent back uh, from places they tried to migrate to. So. Um, uh, this is Aldermaston, which is not very far away. Um, Aldermaston is pretty much, as far as I can make out, as described in the film, in that in that the site again is owned by the site's owned by the MOD, I think, it was by the, by the government anyway. Uh, but the operation has been privatised uh, and is farmed out to a consortium, which seems to be called both AWE PLC and AWE Management Limited. I'm not quite sure why it has two names. Uh, and this being a consortium of two US companies, Jacobs Engineering, Lockheed Martin, and our, um, our old friend Serco. Uh, and AWE Management Limited has a 25 year old contract until 2025. Now, since I made the film, I noticed um, not only do these three companies own or run, collectively run, uh, the atomic weapons establishment, but um, they intruded on my daily life in three ways. Serco um, provide um, a software application which enables schools to monitor their pupils. This was something developed for prisons, I think. Um, and uh, I've never tried to log into it, but I think parents can log into it. If your kid goes to a comprehensive, in England anyway, and they use this stuff, I think you're invited to log in to check up on them. Um, but anyway, and it's known as Serco. Oh, you can look it up on Serco. Uh, it's what the teachers talk about at parents' evening. Um, Jacobs Engineering uh, was subsequently commissioned to initiate the, the controlled parking zone in the street I live in. And Lockheed Martin uh, were contracted to run the last census. So um, these companies, they're very adaptable. Um, they can do all sorts of things. And I suspect they're not really that adaptable. I suspect that the way this occurs is because they've taken things over. Uh, certainly a lot of, for instance, a lot of former local authority architects departments have seemed to have become part of Atkins, uh, which is the largest something or other in the country. Um, so I imagine that the reason why um, Jacobs Engineering initiate the controlled parking zone is because they bought something, which kind of already did that kind of stuff. Uh, although, I mean, I don't know why the council can't do it themselves, but anyway, never mind. It's the county council, which is Tory. Um, now, um, another one was the GPSS. Uh, this is the Padworth uh, fuel depot, which is very near Aldermaston, and is one of the largest depots of the government pipeline, or the former government pipeline and storage system, uh, which was built in the late 30s, had an important role in World War II, supplying aircraft bases, and also the um, operation, I've forgotten the name of it, that took petrol across the channel after D-Day. Um, and... Um, this was sold in 2015 uh, to the Compañía Logística de Hidrocarburos, which is a Spanish. I think, I assume it's a private company, but I could be wrong. It might be, it might be the state pipeline company, but I think it's private. Um, uh, that's the network itself. Uh, it's mostly... I mean, you can see a lot of these dots are U.S. Air Force bases. It was particularly, uh, um, uh, you know, all these, these are all U.S. Air Force. Fairford is often used, is a U.S. base. Um, it used to go to um, Upper Hayford, but Upper Hayford, this bit, this bit's defunct. So that bit doesn't exist anymore because that served Upper Hayford, and Upper Hayford closed ages ago. Uh, Upper Hayford was where one of some of the F-111s that bombed Libya, actually not the ones that bombed Libya, but they, the Libya bombing in 1986, some of the F-111s were based at Upper Hayford. But the Upper Hayford closed ages ago, is now covered in cars. Um, and this is, this is a, uh, a marker, um, 
You can see I like these things. I don't know whether you like them. They're very artistic, I think. Um, especially this one. Um, and there's a story about it, which I might, if you want to know, I can tell you later. Uh, and this is another depot. This is the Islip Depot, which uh, came up for sale in 2012. I did, try, I did put an offer in. Um, it, was, it was terribly funny because the, the, um, we saw a for sale sticker on it, a sign on it, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I wrote down the phone number, rang them up. And they said, well, we're having a viewing today. Would you like to come? <laughs> so I went up there and had a look around. And there were all these blokes in SUVs from Bista. Um, and one of them said, one of them shouted out in a very loud voice, oh, of course, it'll cost millions to clear this lot up. And I thought, why is he, ta why is he shouting so loud? <laughs> because I was probably the only other person there, apart from these. They were obviously a group. And I thought, maybe he's just trying to put me off. And I thought, well, it won't cost that much. And anyway, why clear it up? <laughs> you know, they're all empty. They're all full of water. There's no, there's no petrol here. No aviation fuel anymore. There might be a bit of asbestos. But as, it, as it turned out, there was, actually. Um, so, but it was, it was for sale by informal tender. So I thought, well, that sounds great. You should say what you like <laughs> and change your mind afterwards. So I offered them 300 grand and said that I'd tried to raise the money for a research centre. And um, they were very nice, but they didn't take me up on it. <laughs> and then there was, a, there was a planning application from someone um, who presumably won the tender, who wanted to use it as a base for their road <coughs> maintenance equipment. Uh, but they couldn't get planning permission. So I think in the end, then it went to auction, and it was supposed to have been bought by... Uh, some from people who were described as property speculators, <laughs> or, or something, and it wasn't quite as blatant as that, but it was it was pretty clear that, that it was a speculative purchase by um, a company that that hoped in the future to be able to develop housing on it, which is pretty unlikely because it's well, actually, it's not that unlikely, but it's in a green belt and it's next, you know, Islip is a, a sort of lovely, fluffy village, so they're not going to build wimpy houses there. Um, but um, I'm not sure that went through either, and I think it might still be for sale, so if you're interested, maybe. The, the other funny thing was that they didn't have any photographs. All the only photographs they had of it were all... Um, there was a link to... If you wanted to see photographs, there was a link to an urban explorer's website. And this is the MOD providing uh, prospective purchases with a link to, to a website full of pictures made by people who'd broken in. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, three, it's a big site, £300,000. It was a bargain. Um, and um, it doesn't kind of... I mean, I, and the other thing was that the whole pipeline was sold off for £82 million. And this is a revenue-earning public asset. You know, the, the, the GPSS shifted vast volumes of aviation fuel, not just for the MOD, but for commercial airlines. It's the, it was one of the principal um, means of distributing aircraft fuel. Shall we stop now? Yeah, uh, five minutes, and then we can unplug back questions. Well, that's sort of it, really. <laughs> oh, no, there's one more, actually. One more. Five minutes. <laughs> this is Hampton Gay, so, you, I mean, I think we've probably, you've probably heard enough about that. But this... Um, is where, this is Enslow Hill, which is where the, the, um, the Rising was supposed to assemble, and where two of the protagonists were subsequently hanged, drawn, and quartered. And Enslow Hill, the interesting thing, well, an interesting thing about Enslow Hill is that I've never been able to find it on a map. Um, the only place you ever read about it is in descriptions of the Oxfordshire Rising, and all the references are for two, two or three um, statements extracted under threat of torture from the people who were dragged in and, and um, done over about it. Um, uh, but it's worse than that. Not only does it not exist on maps, um, but quite a lot of it's missing because <laughs> it was quarried uh, in the 19th century. Uh, it's thought to be descended from something called a Spellberg. The reason it was, it was selected by 
Steer and his associates is because he believed it was had been involved in another rising in 1549. It had been the site of a, a, a battle in 1549 between another lot of people and the authorities, but also that it may have been a pre-conquest Spellburger, which is a kind of meeting place, uh, or Speech Hill. So it's quite ironic that it should now be the location of a satellite communication station. Um, uh, and the, when I took this, when I was making the film, it was run by cable and wireless. Uh, and cable and wireless are another of these stories. Cable and wireless dates from the 1860s, uh, when the first submarine telegraphs were established. But it was, it, and it was, it was, it, it kind of, they kind of merged until I'm not sure when it was called Cable and Wireless in the 30s, I think. Uh, it was nationalised after the Second World War. Uh, it was nationalised. It was decided to nationalise it in 47, 45. It was nationalised in 47, um, and then it was privatised. Um, I think before British Telecom um, to be British Telecom's competitor uh, and um, because of course in those days they didn't just have monopoly but privatisation they had, they had to have the idea of competition so um, it was sold off uh, in November 1981 from November 1981 which suggests that maybe it wasn't all sold off at once and, and the licence was granted in 1982 to set up Mercury Telecommunications as a rival to BT and you can, that's, the, that's the significance of this manhole cover if you see it, it says Mercury uh, Mer, I don't know if you remember Mercury used to have phone boxes they used to have these bizarre phone boxes which were designed by somebody called Francis Machen who, who I remember as a student he had something similar on the top of his beach buggy uh, in the 1960s. Um, so that's that, really. Um, that's the end of the story. Um, except that cable and wireless... Mercury disappeared, and cable and wireless are now part of Vodafone. Uh, Vodafone took them over quite recently. And that's where the fictional think tank is supposed to be. Um, and it hasn't been privatised. Uh, because it wasn't part of the public sector. It used to belong to Blue Circle. Um, so I think I'll stop there. I was thinking about um, your other films, London, Robinson and Space. Um, they pretty much deal with this as well, don't they? Privatisation, the problem of London. Well, the, the bits, the, the, the rest of this yeah. um, you know, unending thing is, is about... Um, it was a similar selection from Robinson in Space. And actually there weren't that many, but they were bigger. Um, Yorkshire Water was, was the big one. I don't hear, does anyone remember the, the Yorkshire Water Crisis of 1995, <laughs> which involved, um, they nearly had to evacuate Bradford, um, and there were tankers, there were fleets, of, a whole fleet of about kind of 100 tankers or something, tankering water out of reservoirs into places like Halifax, um, and we happened to pass by this with our camera, um, and were able to memorialise it. Um, and that was, I mean, it's not quite clear how that was a consequence of privatisation, but it, it sort of was, I think. There was, a, uh, there was a funny story about the chief executive of Yorkshire Water claiming that he, you didn't need to have a bath, you could wash it in the sink. And then it was revealed that he, he was visiting his relatives outside the country to have baths on the quiet. <laughs> I think he had to resign. <laughs> So there was that, yeah, but, and there was private prisons. Uh, the, the, there was private prisons, there was the, the, the coal mines, of course, I mean, that was the, again, so the, the, it was a more serious, I think, I mean, most of these, um, are they frivolous? They're not frivolous, but I mean, they're kind of fairly minor. Hmm. I suppose the gas grid is, is, that's quite a big one. Aldermaston is a big one. And the, the one I haven't done is Sellafield, which is a, just an amazing mess. 
And in fact, Sellafield has been, as far as I can make out, unprivatized mm. uh, because of the private sector consortium making such a dog's dinner of it. So, um, uh, and they, of course, they never privatized the site because no one would want that. But the operations were um, <coughs> let out to another of these tripartite international consortia mm. until, um, I think, last year. Yeah. yeah, in 2016, Sellafield Limited became a subsidiary of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. So mm. that's the end of that. But, you know, I mean, that's possibly something that one wouldn't necessarily want. But I was also thinking just kind of... Um, in a bigger way, I was thinking about London, and I'm pretty sure it's in the film, or maybe it's in one of your essays. Uh, a kind of bigger. Well, there's two things really. There seems to be a bigger, uh, as, as as kind of well as being a kind of economic fuck up and an economic alibi. There seems to be a bigger process of um, of almost a kind of privatization of experience behind behind privatization, which we're living in. I'm never quite sure what the relationship is between kind of economics, technology, and the production of subjectivities. Well, people do blame um, individualism for um, you know, the, the willingness of, of, of citizens who speak English, at any rate, to produce the state. Mm. There's a, um, I don't know, there's, a, you know, there's this book out. I was reading a review of it only, only yesterday. <laughs> Um, in the Guardian, um, about you know um, Polly Toynbee and David Walker have written this book about the state, and the reviewer was seeking explanations for this strange phenomenon. But uh, I mean, w the thing about the, the difference between this film mm -hmm. and the others is that this one is about well, it's not about, but it it it, it, it addresses or or ends up dis re re re. Well, not rediscovering because it was, wasn't lost, but um, it ends up with the the problem of land ownership actually, which was the first big privatizer. I mean, the, you know, like the the the, um, the the enclosing of the commons by the new gentry in the late 16th century and before, <coughs> but particularly after the dissolution of the monasteries, um, was. Um, according to people who are much better able to talk about it than I am, uh, the beginnings of uh, you know English agrarian capitalism, which yeah. preceded the world we live in. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, you come across this again in um, in um, Captain Swing um, in the book. Um, uh, the first paragraph is about um, anyone visiting Britain in the 1800s would, from Europe would, would notice immediately that something was missing. Mm. There were no peasants. Uh, the peasant, mm. um, oh, and this goes back to this mm. thing about dwelling that I was yeah. talking about to begin with, um, uh, and Shelley with, you know, all things have a home but one, thou, O Englishman, hast none. Mm. What does he mean? You know, he's not just talking about Byron. Mm. He means the ordinary people. Mm. Uh, they've been dispossessed. Mm. Um, and um, the, yeah. the question is, um, I, I suppose the question this raises, which is how do you unprivatize things? Yes. How do you, how do you, how, I mean, yeah. The, the, the land, you know, the, the, the land still belongs to the crown. I mean, forgive me because this is so um, unlikely that it seems ridiculous to talk about it, but the land still belongs to the crown. It's only the freehold that belongs to private mm. owners. Uh, and, and you see that on the beach. Um, the, 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 the picture that I was going to, to show, the last picture, which is too far away to get to, but it's about... Um, it's some beach huts on the high tide, above the high tide mark, between the high tide mark and a railway line on the west coast of Cumberland, or Cumbria as it's called. Um, and there's some plumes from Sellafield in the background. So it, it was the Sellafield image, but it also had a railway line and some beach huts which are privately owned, but the land is owned by some local aristocrat. 
and the tenure of the beach hut is such that you're only allowed to live there for 11 months of the year, allegedly. I was told by one of the people who lives there for 11 months of the year, and the other month he goes off to Lanzarote or somewhere. Um, but below the high water mark, it's crown property. Uh, and it's still, you know, like the, uh, an out to, I'm not sure what the limit is, but like that's why if you put a wind farm in, in the sea, within the limit, you've got to get, you've got to square it with the Crown Estate. Now, of course, the Queen doesn't own the Crown Estate. Whatever, when one says it belongs to the Crown, it doesn't mean it belongs to the Queen. That would be ridiculous. Uh, the Queen has swapped the Crown Estate for the civil list, as I understand it. Um, so, but, but the fact remains that all the land in the United Kingdom belongs to the Crown Estate, <laughs> ultimately, ultimately. Um, and um, it, it also belongs in another way to the public sector in that planning commission uh, is in the control of, by and large, local authority. So the, the value that accrues, for instance, the value that accrues to residential development sites that haven't yet been developed is pretty much in the gift of the state. So if you're a greedy farmer, or just not a greedy farmer, but if you're a developer, um, then um, you presumably haggle with a landowner over the price of the land. Um, but the price of the land really is determined by how many dwellings you can put on it and by the surrounding property market. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons why house builders build so slowly because they don't want to flood the market. Um, mm. uh, I once asked, I once went, I was once, in, I made another film about houses, which yeah. you, you might know about. Um, um, we, we went to countryside properties who had built something called uh, Great Notley Garden Village. He took us, a young man took us around this Great Notley place, which is quite interesting, it's kind of private sector community, it's not gated. But it has, a, you know, it has a cricket field and a village hall and all the rest of it. Yeah, and, and, and his shtick was that the way that we could have afford, the way they, countryside, could afford to build all this stuff was by negotiating a lower price for the land <coughs> with the previous owner. And um, they did that by saying, look, unless we do all these things, we're never going to get planning permission, so you'll never be able to sell it. So it's a kind of deal. And um, so in two ways, um, I mean, I, it presumably would be very difficult for the state to expropriate private property owners. People, uh, as soon as you mention that, people start talking about Robert Mugabe. Uh, uh, although um, you do hear it even from Tories, actually. You, you hear Tory, even Tories. I'm not sure who they are, I can't remember talking about land nationalisation these days, because the situation is so ridiculous. Um, maybe not in the last couple of years, but I have, I have noted it in the past. Mm. Um, but, so, so instead of, um, sorry, I've forgotten what, how we got onto this, but it, it's, it's to do with the notion of belonging. Yeah. Uh, instead of wondering, instead of all thinking, oh, we belong to the landscape, isn't it wonderful? You know, we're all like, you know, like um, hunter-gatherers. Um, uh, which is a nice thing to think. Uh, uh, um, but it's, 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 it's not practical, because actually the, the landscape belongs to someone else. <laughs> if you go for a walk in the country, you're very quickly reminded yeah. uh, at every turn that the landscape doesn't belong to you. Now, it, now, there is, on the other hand, of course, a very good system of public footpaths, certainly where I live. So you're not reminded very hard. Mm. But um, it, it really comes down to it mm. when one thinks about the predicament of the housing system. The, the housing system is broken. And one of the reasons it's broken is because of um, the, the, the existence of a, an, unassailable, an, an unassailable notion of private property. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, the yeah. sort of reformist answer is not, oh, well, of course, we can't have land nationalisation because everybody will shout Robert Mugabe. Uh, but uh, so you could have a property tax, hmm. which is a bit boring actually. Huh. Um, but that's what people say. 
I was thinking of two things that are maybe to the side of that, maybe not so kind of um, as concrete. Uh, and I was thinking again about this kind of notion. I, I was also thinking of, again, to go back to London, which, you know, which is kind of posed as a kind of, um, an, a kind of exploration of the problem of English, particularly English capital, which this film returns to with the commons and the, the kind of enclosures. But I just remember there's a really stunning moment where somebody, it's a quote from a writer, I think, maybe a Russian emigre, who arrives in London and says he's never been in a place where he's felt so utterly miserable and alone. Oh, he doesn't say that. Well, but he doesn't he kind of say something like that? There's no town in the world, I can't remember yeah. what he says, there's no town in the world, but he's not, he's not, he doesn't mind. He's just, <laughs> he's quite, you know, it's quite, it's a good place to work, you know. Yeah, but it's a um, pretty miserable experience. For they, it's about they leave you alone. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say that. You know, Zaha Hadid, I remember, in the, in, the, in the 80s, she said, oh, London's such a good place to work. I mean, I've forgotten what she said, but it was like there are no distractions. Um, Hertzen, it's Alexander Hertzen, he writes about the absence, the absence of continental diversions. Hmm. Um, uh, that's what he's writing about. Okay. And that's why I feel able at the end of the film to say London, the true identity, of, or whatever I do yeah. say, the true identity of London, what Robinson says, is in, is in its absence. Huh. And it's not quite clear whether that's the absence of London or the absence of an identity, yeah. which is, I think, what I meant. Well, I, well, I didn't know what I meant because I wrote it, mm. and it, I didn't. It's not me; it's it's him. Yeah. So you can, in this kind of situation, you can write stuff without knowing what it means, which is quite interesting, I find, because you work it out afterwards. But I think, I suspect, what I would like him to mean mm. is that uh, the identity of London is in not having an identity, because mm. that's quite good. Yeah. You know, that's the good thing about sure. it. It I may, be, it, yeah. may be uncomfortable. Yeah. London, it is extremely uncomfortable. But it, it, it's not like, um, it, you know, it's not, it's not, there are no postcards. Hmm. You know, they're, well, they are, but they're all rubbish. And then some places like Prague, the postcards are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then can I just ask one thing before maybe we open it out, is that um, I guess, again, it comes back to this question of ecology and maybe it's a question of resources, whatever, whatever resources mean in the, kind of, in, in, in the larger sense for you in this project, for this forum as well. But I was, but of course, the meaning of ecology, which everybody knows, I guess, comes from oikos, which means home, I guess, I guess home or a half in Greek. So there seems to, but, but there seems to be a real tension. That's in economics. There is, that's what I was going to say. There's, there, there, there appears to be a real tension between, the, and I think the tension's played out in the film, bizarrely, under what we might call a kind of desire for utter control or to territorialize everything. So you have these two moments of a desire for a dwelling and yet, and, and yet oikonomikos that would kind of undercut that in a way to the point where I think someone like, you know, I, don't, I think someone like Leotard says actually, you know, these, these two things need to be decoupled but they can never be decoupled. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're completely kind of caught up between each other. And it struck me that watching the film, what was quite interesting about the flowers and the nature, there was a lot of stuff going on there a lot of stuff that we couldn't quantify, but yet constantly within the film, there, were, there, there appeared to be desires to territorialize that and to control that type of uncontrollability. And I kind of wonder that, which we might see as a desire to privatize, that's certainly what I sort of feel privatization in a larger sense means. But I think that we almost might link that up to your project, this project that you're asking about contemporary art and creativity, and the kind of desire under a privatised market, really, to kind of always control and to make that become utterly, utterly utile. That, that there will be no excess. It will be made to serve an absolutely utilitarian purpose. It will be served to be a control purpose. And that seems to be, to be a kind of recipe for utter disaster, as if capital can only undermine itself I don't know what you think about that, Patrick. I don't know about that. I, I mean, I, 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 it seems to me that there isn't much utility in, in consumerism. You know, what's, yeah. what's utilitarian about an Audi Q8? Not a lot. But people buy them. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I was wondering. Well, I guess the should, workers making them as well. We should <laughs> open up the discussion if there's any time to everybody else, um, and and but also about these questions. Um, yeah, so, yeah, shall we do that then? Just open it up if anyone has any questions. We're meant to finish at nine, but we can go over a little bit if everyone's up for hanging about. Um, should we read the yeah. question? Do we need the questions to be read out? Do people know well, what they are? questions, yeah. yeah. Well, or, well, any questions. Yeah. Um, either or. <laughs> I, I was going to ask a question. I think Sorry. if you think it's helpful, I think you can. Well, question three, how can we actively transform art, work, and culture for the better? It's uh, a good question. And I was wondering, oh, what, what can you possibly say? And I said to myself, does art have to be critical? I mean, I don't know, I hope not. Because, I mean, that, you know, all this stuff is... But maybe that's not really what it's about. Um... What do people think? I mean, these questions were deliberately quite broad to frame, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. frame yeah. things, uh, um, which I think has been helpful. Uh, who who thinks art should be critical? Can we hear the questions? Yeah, so... Yeah. You, I read them out. Yeah, <laughs> First one, who and what determines how cultural resources are distributed and for what purposes? This is from the synopsis. Yeah. That's the first one. What are the effects of privatisation on the arts? How can we actively transform art, work and culture for the better? And then, how can we build radically new forms of collective cross-cultural organisation? So, we can answer all these questions. <laughs> We've got it made. The last one was to sort of uh, open it out away from this immediate situation. Like, okay, the post office is sort of taking over the space, but we're much more interested in, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the action of having multiple voices and multiple spheres of culture in this space, and then opening up the sort of layers that might, you know, if you want to call them layers, um, appear. And yesterday we had, you know, people from the Housing Association, Revail, uh, talking to people, an artist who is, uh, Jonathan I think is here still, I don't know, if, um, Jonathan Hoskins, who's kind of, uh, he's also a committee member of a housing association in London, and how these kind of connect, um, and Revail is our land, so maybe this sounds a bit disparate, but I think, I feel like that went in a sort of direction yesterday. I think the idea was like maybe to like stop, stop being so insular about our situation and trying to understand what's happening on a grander scale that is literally very much affecting us in a very immediate um, <coughs> realm and it's like happening now but we want to see rather than what like trying to understand what's happening to us here in like quite a physical sense but also trying to understand maybe on a grander scale which is why we organized also get tomorrow where we got like people from the media company and economists and like trying to like maybe like see other sections of culture that have maybe a different point of view. Um, but this, I think it'd be helpful if anyone else has any questions uh, or responses to any of this kind of stuff and then we can you know, move towards wrapping up. Um, I was kind of thinking about sort of the meaning of
shadow, which isn't necessarily about. So I guess there is this idea from Crayola, Colarnic Shadow, that it's that um, <coughs> uh, art tends to fall into two categories, which is like it creates an aura and it's, it's like non critical and it's just like you'll congregate around darkness. Um, or it seems to sort of directly engage people on a through sort of direct communication and, and in a way kind of um, it can be quite atomizing because it's saying art can mean anything to anybody, which kind of means nothing. So in a way I see art as like trying to maintain shadow somehow, like kind of tending to a shadow that makes anything. And um, just yeah, that was just a truly thought. Can you say that last bit again? What, the first thought or the second thought? The second. Oh, I would have thought it was the other way around. Yeah, surely. Um. But um, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. I think it's, it's this idea that some artworks seek to kind of, they seek to engage on a level which maybe doesn't, um, doesn't have regard for a shadow, which is like kind of necessarily created in some work which just reflects the way that we live, or somehow has holds the contradictions together. Would, an, would another way of saying that be that some, some are more apprehended more quickly than others? Could be and that maybe the ones that take longer are better? Or <laughs> am I... Misinterpreting what you're saying. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of time, but in a way that's sort of in the objects, maybe. Um, maybe it's like. Yeah, I don't know. It's just the sense of like being quite dumb to like some of these pieces of art, and almost like that being generative, like a way to really think about where they came from, what they mean. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I don't know, I was just thinking about what it says about the postcards of London in a way. Postcards? Yeah, yeah. It's just that it kind of is like there is more density. I mean, I don't know, one of the things that um, when this film was being made, there was a discussion between me and my colleagues about the role of images. Um, and the way that what images, how images um, flatten experience. If, I mean, flatten is maybe the wrong word. Mm -hmm. um, um, and a, an example um, <coughs> I think Doreen used to talk about smoothing. The way that the, the, the subjects of a, these images like this often involve. Um, 
tensions between things that are visible if you're there, mm. uh, but that the image somehow um, um, removes them. Yeah. <coughs> Um, I mean, I'm not sure if all images do that, or just yeah. some images. I think we've got another question. Mm. Can I, sorry Sam, can I just respond to that a little bit? Sorry. Yeah. So, sorry about it, just... I think it's quite interesting, I think this idea, because I guess that would be a kind of anti-image, kind of anti you know, as you say, maybe not all images do that. Um, I think that there can be other images that can, you know, and I think it's dependent upon a spectator who therefore would be disembodied. Whereas I think that there can be other images that don't have that kind of, that kind of, um, that flattening. I think that there, there can be other images that can produce quite effective modes of thinking, maybe a kind of phenomenological way of watching in which, the, in which, in, in, in which your eye might be touched and in which a sense of movement actually could be in the image. So I'm not always so, I'm not always so sure that images are so flattening. And even sometimes when they do flatten, I think sometimes that they can vibrate in a different way, and that they can produce kind of energy forms or force fields, rather than simply flattening our experience. Uh, it's a kind of observation type question really in respond to those, those, those questions that were read to us. It seems to me that one of the opportunities for an artist, or for any of us engaged in political debate and discourse, I don't think it's an obligation for an artist, but it's an opportunity for the artist, is to, is to challenge the terms of the debate. To try more and more to, to denaturalize what is now become natural and supposed to be normal and habitual, whether it be the market about the wonderfulness of choice, about, uh, about the private over the public, the private over the state. The, the, the terms of this debate are so skewed now that the centre of gravity is, that, is so much on one side, I think, that, that's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Centre of gravity on one side. You know what I mean? I think it, it's, yeah. it, it, it's this, this challenge uh, to to denaturalize the normal and the, and, and the, the so-called natural in the terms of political debate. I think what I'm wary about that is just continuing that frame of mind of black and white is at the same time just continuing the same structure and the same framing and uh, way of thinking. So you're actually not changing anything, you're just continuing things. So I'm, I am a bit wary of like, even that particular saying that you have to challenge. I think the word challenge in itself, mm. the idea is just like, it's like you're on the battle, it's not a battle, it's not you against someone. I think starting from that is already a severe mistake, which is why for us it's a bit hard to be where we're sitting in this situation. Mm. By challenge, I don't mean saying, well, it's not black, it's white. Mm. I don't mean that. I, I meant to kind of complexify like, I think the, the, the productive frame, way what Thinking is. of that, like from the start, from the thought, it already says, says that you have an enemy. See you again, something. Again, it's a really interesting point that Patrick made earlier about you talking about this being like a power of public serving. And obviously, if one is dependent on state funding, the terms of the criticism of debate will be constrained by the nature of giving funding and what's accepted. Yeah. Did you find that with the AHRC? I mean, I noticed they funded the film. Um, not explicitly, no. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's not quite as straightforward as that. The, the, um, the conditions of production of any of these things um, affect the outcome. So, you know, people don't have to say anything. Um, it's... It's... it's um, it's much more subtle than that. Um, Could you uh, explain why? What? Why um, it's more subtle? Well, I suppose. I mean, because because I suppose um, as a as the person who's making the work, I have in the back of my mind an idea about its reception, and I might or might not do certain things depending on what I think its reception is going to be. 
I mean, I suppose that applies to anything. Yeah. Um, uh, it would be silly to think that it doesn't apply to anyone making, I mean, if you have a gallery or if you have an audience, never mind, but, but, if, uh, but, but uh, it's possible to make work without, presumably without having any of these things. Um, it might be difficult to make, you know, 101 minute films, but um, even that nowadays um, it is not, not, um, it, you know, there are other ways of doing it, you don't have to have a job. Um, uh, uh, another question, but, but the other question I suppose is does it have to be rectangular? I mean, that's, that's more difficult, which is one that I often, I often wonder about. You say, why are they all rectangular, you know? What I mean, with films, they're all the, they're not uh, the same rectangle, but they tend to be, yeah. by and large, at any one time, the same rectangle. So if you go back then to the, if you go back to the Institute exhibition, yeah. That seemed to be offering a different model. Um, yes. You know. Yes, but that's another. Um, that's another thing about whether to make a film or not. Um, I mean, when I was making this film, um, I didn't set out to challenge linearity, which you might do, hmm. but I did. Was conscious um, that if you're making a film about landscape. There is this rather unsatisfactory business of putting one thing after another, when in <laughs> fact landscape isn't like that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and one of the goals of this film was to be unlike mm. its predecessor, in that um, the predecessor tended to be a lot of yeah. a very large number of locations with maybe yeah. one or two images of each, whereas this mm. one. Uh, it's not as many locations, and there are more images of each, and some of them, some of the locations are intervisible. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, I suspect that's not, you can't really figure that out from watching it. But, um, but on the other hand, film space isn't constructed, in my experience, as a replica of actual space. Yeah. Film space is constructed in, in, as a fictional space. Uh, so the fact that they are kind of in more or less the same place, which is kind of obvious, perhaps, or, or discernible, yeah. um, is, um, means that there is more of a sense of um, something that isn't just yeah, a rectangle yeah. over there and then another rectangle over five miles away. There seem to be, sorry, there seems to be a lot more time in, in this film, if that makes sense, in some of well, the it's images. It's a lot slower. Yeah. yeah. I have a seed of thought in my mind. I think it's maybe triggered by that lovely map that you showed us, Patrick, which was almost the kind of your storyboard for the film. You know that one that you drew your finger around? Yes, except it was retrospective. Yeah. Nonetheless, I kind of think that maybe that's made the link in my head, but I, I, I was thinking somewhere halfway through this presentation, the artist Mark Lombardi came to mind. And I don't know if you know his work, but um, Mark Lombardi was a really interesting artist. And he did something which I think might connect some things that Carl said about your films. It reminds me of some things that you said just in your presentation and answers maybe three or four questions <laughs> on this list. So wow. So I think it's really <laughs> That's cool. amazing. It's worth maybe just laying it out in a couple of sentences. Mark Lombardi's made maps or constellations. So it's a bit like, I suppose, if Patrick were to kind of break up his film and then make it, make it into a kind of big constellation artwork across that wall, what that would look like. Mark Lombardi's work looked a bit like that. But what Mark Lombardi did uh, was that he just mapped the territory. And it was very, very like, and I, th I think in that debate about what art might do, whether or not it's critical, I think what's really clear was extraordinary about sitting in a room with you and listening to you talk about that journey of the places you went to, is how attentive you were. And just that kind of idea of just being attentive to what's there and what's maybe just below the surface. And that what Mark Lombardi did was, in, in information that was all just in public domain, he made maps of relationships. And they were, you know, they were sort of, so he would look at George Bush, he would look at ICI, and he would look at their relation to the contrast. And, you know, he'd make, spend maybe six months making just a map. And then, like you were saying, Carl, about that moment of 
elimination, you would see all of a sudden in the density and complexity of that, all of a sudden you would say, fuck, yeah, hmm. that makes so much sense. There's the epiphany, which is that. So in terms of this first question here, who determines and what determines how cultural resources are distributed and for what purposes? I think that's a great question. But we just need somebody with Patrick's attention to detail to go and actually just find out and map it <laughs> and make all those connections there. Same for the there second you. question. <laughs> then same for the third question. And then I think that is a pretty good ground for the fourth <laughs> question, which is to say, you know, when we command them, when we just hold that knowledge and we're attentive enough uh, and hold that knowledge, we are really in power. Mm -hmm. Then we can think radically about, you know, compulsory purchase orders and the rights, uh, how we organize ourselves to kind of claim that part. So kind of knowing the territory, I think it's relatively straightforward, but I don't think it's straightforward to be the kind of person that Patrick is, because I think that's rather extraordinary, so rather extraordinary commitment to, you know, to do, it, it requires a particular type of brain and a, to, a particular sort of determination over an awful long period of time. So, yeah, solved it all. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I just say, uh, just like you're speaking about territory and landscape, like I was thinking about this question yesterday, but it's maybe it's not a question, it's more about provocation and probably a very obvious one and naive one, but I was just wondering if anyone had any thoughts on the possibility of an end of in Scotland and this kind of conversation and that kind of sense of politics and territory and landscape and land ownership and building and DIY can fit into these questions and to this conversation because I know we're focusing on a kind of general UK wide conversation we've got speakers from other places but I wonder if anyone could feed into that as a kind of more specific Patrick do you know if, if like you know, that you said the, the UK is owned by the Crown. Do you know if like, an independent Scotland would, would, would be able to reclaim that? Like, you know, the definitive... That was why independent Scotland would never be allowed to happen in the first place. What's that? That's why independent Scotland would never be allowed to happen in the first place. And so, it would never be allowed to happen. So you're As saying... As someone who independence, it would never be allowed to happen. So... Before the Jason's Unless happened. you have a Scottish <laughs> king, you know? <laughs> 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 Well, um, no, I don't know. Um, but the, the question of land ownership is a much liver issue in Scotland, isn't it? Um, and one of the reasons for that is because land ownership, as a, if I'm right in thinking, um, is much more concentrated in Scotland. I mean, the problem about, well, something that's happened in England Sorry? The Duke of Buckley wants most of it. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, um, they used to say all sorts of things about land ownership in England, but what seems to be happening, there's a, uh, and I rely entirely on a book, um, there's a book called Who Owns Britain, I think it's called, by um, Kevin Cahill. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very, it's quite an old book. Um, and it's an extremely strange book. Kevin Cahill, I guess he's an Irish, I think he's Irish, journalist, and he lives in Devon. And he may not live anymore. He may, he, I don't know whether he's still alive, because I think he was quite old. The book came out in about 2000. I think. And it's published by, I think it's published by Karen Gate. Um, and I read it from cover to cover, and it, I've never read a book that seems not to have been copy edited before. Um, but it's dynamite, sort of. Um, but one of the things that seems to, to be happening is that um, as farms, farther of, as, as the farms decrease in number in England, which tends to happen, farms tend to, to merge or be bought by other farms. So there are a fewer total number of farms. Um, but I think, on the other hand, the big landowners are selling off farms. So land ownership, which used to be concentrated more um, in 
you know, large aristocratic estates with tenant farmers. I mean, the, the sort of the captain swing model, which was, was the aristocratic landowner, the tenant farmer, and the way the landless labourer. Um, but that seems to be more complicated now in that there are smaller numbers of farmers, but larger numbers of landholders. Hmm. I think you've got that right. So, uh, but anyway, so mm, it's yeah. more difficult. In other words, it's more difficult because you can't just expropriate a load of aristocrats, which would be—I mean, it wouldn't be easy, but it would be kind of simple. <laughs> or, um, but in Scotland, it's still a bit like that. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, um, but there's also, of course, the problem of owner-occupied housing. I mean, I don't know what you do about that because you know. I mean, owner, well, on the other hand, of course, owner occupation is going down. In London, it's now below 50% of households, um, which has quite a lot of interesting implication. Because one of the reasons why the government doesn't do anything about housing is because they don't want to piss off owner occupiers hmm. by, by dropping their house value. Hmm. Because people kind of probably believe that they are wealthy if their house doubles in value over you know, five or ten years. Mm. It is. I think, um, sorry, if we leave it uh, there and then we can move through to the other gallery yeah, if sorry. anyone has any questions. But just because just we've got 22 minutes over, over time. But yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone, and thanks so much for Patrick for coming all the way from